In this video, we are going to continue our discussion of Chapter 5, Systems of Linear Equations. So if you recall from last video, we were talking about the mathematical background. Um, and in uh, this video, we're going to continue that. And then in the next few videos, we're going to get into solving systems of linear equations and using, using iterative methods to solve linear systems. So here, um, in the previous video, you recall that we talked about um, introduced matrices as these uh, the functions between vector spaces. Um, and then we talked about matrix notation and how the um, systems of linear equations are related to this matrix notation. And now we're going to get into talking about special types of square matrices. So first, uh, a matrix where m equals n is called a square matrix. So the number of rows is equal to the number of columns. So for example, um, this A here is a 4 by 4 square matrix. So the dimension is 4 by 4, where M and N are both equal to 4. The diagonal consisting of the elements A11, A22, A33, A44 is called the main diagonal of the matrix. So you see the um, subscripts are repeated in each of the elements along the main diagonal. Square matrices are particularly important when solving sets of simultaneous linear equations. As we saw um, in the previous video, the number of equations or rows and the number of unknowns or columns must be equal in order to determine a unique solution for our system of linear equations. So knowing um, what a square matrix is, there are some special types of square matrices that are important. So a symmetric matrix is one where aij is equal to aji for every i and j in, um, in R. So basically this means that um, the matrix A is equal to its transpose A uh, transpose. So in each of the elements, um, if you look at the elements here, aij is equal to aji. So this would be a12 is equal to a21. So if you look at the example here, a, um, you can see that a12 and a21 are equal. And the, the values on the diagonal, it doesn't really matter, but every value that's off the diagonal, um, it has to be kind of symmetric about that, about the diagonal. So the identity matrix, which is denoted I, is the matrix whose diagonal components have the value of one and its off diagonal components have a value of zero. So for example, this is the uh, identity matrix, um, a three by three identity matrix. So you can, again, you see the only non-zero values are all along the diagonal and they're all equal to one. So the identity matrix is essentially the matrix extension of multiplying by unity or multiplying by one. So it takes every vector x and returns the same vector. So if I take, um, for example, i times x in, um, in r3, if x is in r3, I get x again. So basically it's like in, in the scalar equivalent of, of that would be just multiplying a number by one. So i times x is equal to x. A diagonal matrix is a square matrix where all the elements off the main diagonal are zero. So for example, um, we in a four by four matrix, we may have A11, A22, A33, A44. Um, or, you know, this example here, where the only non-zero values are, um, or sorry, where all of the values off the diagonal are equal to zero, and the values on the diagonal, you can see that they can be equal to zero, but they can have um, non-zero values. So the identity matrix is an example of a diagonal matrix. An upper triangular matrix is one where all the elements below the main diagonal are zero. So you can see that it kind of forms this, this triangle in the upper, in the upper um, portion of the matrix here. So all of the elements below the main, main diagonal are zero. So these are just examples in a four by four and a three by three of upper triangular matrices. 
A lower triangular matrix is one where all the elements above the main diagonal are zero. So again, these are examples of lower triangular matrices. So you can see that the, the only elements that um, can be non-zero are the ones on the lower triangle part and all of the elements above the main diagonal are equal to zero. A banded matrix has all the elements equal to zero except those on the main diagonal and one or more diagonals on either side. So it's, it's a band that's centered on the main diagonal. And the bandwidth is the maximum number of elements, uh, maximum number of columns on the same row that have non-zero entries. So for example, um, shown here, you can see that the main diagonal can be non-zero and then um, some on uh, on either side of that and so and it, but it has to be symmetric about the main diagonal so here i've got um, one diagonal on either side that are allowed to be non-zero so the bandwidth in both of these cases um, so the same thing here we've got this main diagonal so it has some non-zero elements and then one um, diagonal on either side and you could have more diagonals on either side um, and the the maximum number of columns on the same row that have non-zero entries. So for example, this, we've got the maximum number is three. So this means that both of these um, have a bandwidth of three. And when a, a, a banded matrix has a bandwidth of three, it's called a tridiagonal matrix. So it's given um, an additional special term. So let's talk about matrix operations. So matrix addition, we've got some matrix A equal to B plus C. What does that mean? This means that each of the elements of A are equal to the sum of the elements of B and C. So it's an element-wise operation where Bij plus Cij is equal to Aij. Um, matrix addition is a commutative, so that means that I, d I can say that A plus B is equal to B plus A, so it doesn't matter what order um, I do it in. It's also associative. So A, if we have three matrices, A plus B plus C, um, it does, again, it doesn't matter which order I do it in. So I can do A plus B and then plus C, or I can do B plus C and then add A plus B plus C. Um, those are all equivalent. Um, a scalar multiplication of a matrix involves multiplying each component by the, the the scalar. So if I've got Ka equal to B, that means that each element or each component, Aij, is multiplied by that same scalar K, and that gives me each element in B. And matrix subtraction can be handled by combining these rules. So basically if I make my, um, my scalar here K equals to negative 1, then I can combine the rules of scalar multiplication and addition to get subtraction. So matrix multiplication um, is, is shown here. So we've got two matrices A and B. Um, A times B is equal to C. So what does that mean? Well, it means that um, this is not an element-wise operation. So for every, um, basically a, a loop over K from 1 to M, and then for every I and J, um, I have A, I, K, times bkj is equal to cij. So let's see what this means. m is the, the column dimensions of a and the row dimensions of b. So if a is an n by m matrix and b is an m by l matrix, um, this m here has to be the same. Um, so it's the column dimensions of, of a and the row dimensions of b. That is what this sum goes over from k from one to one from one to m, and then the result, um, the resulting matrix C is n by l. So it takes the sort of outer dimensions here become the results. So the inner dimensions have to be the same, and then the outer dimensions become the dimensions of the result. So for example, if I have A is um, shown here and B shown here. So the 
A is a 3 by 2 and B is a 2 by 4. Um, the result is, is given by this. So you can see first that the inner dimensions are the same and then the outer dimensions um, is the, going to be the dimensions of our result C. So C we expect to be a 3 by 4 matrix. And how this is done is by um, is by going through this sum for every i and j. So if we start with i equals 1 and j equals 1, then we take um, a11 times a b11, so 1 times 2, plus, so now we're summing from k goes from 1 to m, so in this case m is 2, so plus 4, so which is a12 um, times b21, so plus 4 times 0, and that all goes in my c11. And then I um, continue on. So I do this for every i and j. So this is my i's for every i goes down this direction, for every j goes across this direction, and then each of those elements I sum from 1 to m. And the result is, is shown here. So you can go through this and see kind of how each of the um, elements are arrived at, and then basically this is my c. And as you can see, c is a 3 by 4. So let's look at um, this in a little bit more detail. So again, we said that the inner dimensions have to be the same. So we can go 3 by 2 times 2 by 4. And then the outer dimensions become the dimensions of the result. So in this case, 3 by 4. So in this example, A times B produces a matrix with dimensions 3 by 4. But the operation B times A is not defined. Um, because the inner dimensions would not match. So if we put b times a, we would have, um, so b times a, b is a 2 by 4, and a is 3 by 2. So this doesn't work because these dimensions are not the same. And just a note about um, MATLAB, so the syntax for the product of two matrices is C is equal to A star B, um, and that would perform the matrix multiplication as defined here. If you want to just multiply the elements of each um, matrix to get a, a result, so basically Cij is equal to Aij times Bij, then the syntax is c is equal to a dot star b. So you have to put this dot to do the element-wise multiplication. Um, but that is a, those are two different things, and it's important to know the distinction. So actual matrix multiplication um, should be done with this syntax here, and um, the result is what we just discussed. So when the dimensions are appropriate, matrix multiplication is associative and it is distributive. So if we're given three matrices A, B, and C, then um, A times B times C, so basically if we put, if we do this operation first, B times C times A is the same as doing A times B first times C. And it's also distributed, so A times B plus C is equal to a times b plus a times c. However, matrix multiplication, even if the dimensions are appropriate, matrix multiplication is not, in general, commutative. So a times b is not equal to b times a. So the order that you um, write the matrices, it matters. Okay, so let's talk about the matrix inverse. Um, so first, let's revisit the identity matrix and indicate that multiplying any square matrix A with an identity matrix I leaves the original matrix unchanged. So A times I is equal to A. So this allows us to define the inverse of the matrix. So given a matrix A, the inverse of A is denoted A 
um, superscript minus 1, and it is defined such that a inverse times a is equal to i. It's also um, a times a inverse is also equal to i. So when I multiply a matrix with its inverse, um, I should be I, I will get the identity matrix. And in this case, the order um, doesn't matter. So I can either go a inverse a or a times a inverse. Either one, I'll get the identity matrix. So a matrix determinant, um, we can talk a little bit about that. So if we have a two by two matrix A, such that A is equal to um, A1, A2, B1, B2. So the top rows are A1, A2, and the second row is um, B1, B2. Then the determinant of A, which is denoted det, and then between brackets, um, the name of our matrix, is equal to A1, B2 times A2, B1. So it's a1, b2, minus a2, b1. And we can notice that if the rows of a are linearly dependent, um, so for example, a1, a2 is just equal to some scalar alpha times b1, b2 for any alpha in R, then the determinant will be equal to zero. And this goes both ways. If the determinant is equal to zero, then we know that um, the rows of A are linearly dependent. In, uh, for a three by three matrix defined here, so we've got um, A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3, the determinant is defined here. So um, it's A1 times um, b2 times c3 minus b3 times c2 plus a2 times um, b3 times c1 minus b1 times c3 plus a3 times b1 c2 minus b2 c1 and again it, you can see if the rows of a are linearly dependent then the determinant will equal the determinant of a will equal zero and um, this little arrow means that this goes both ways um, if and only if so the determ if the determinant of a is equal to zero then the um, rows are linearly dependent so we could generalize this for an n by n matrix A. The determinant of A can be defined using this recursive relationship. So um, the de determinant of A is equal to the sum, as i goes from 1 to n, of um, minus 1 to the power of i plus 1 times the component of A in the first um, row and the ith column times the determinant of the matrix that is left. So n here, n i, has a dimension n minus 1 by n minus 1, and it is formed by eliminating the first row and the ith column of the matrix A. So we saw that um, in the, the 3 by 3. So basically, if we had our 3 by 3 matrix, A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3. So what I mean here is um, I take A1 and then I cover up the i-th um, the, the i-th column and the first row and then this this is the determinant of the matrix that is left. And then we do that um, for each uh, column. So just some important notes as we've kind of used a few different um, terminologies to describe the same thing um, throughout this video and the previous one. So given a square matrix A, the following are equivalent. If the rows of a matrix A are linearly dependent, um, then A is not invertible, so it doesn't have an inverse, and it is called singular. And this, um, again, goes the other way. So A is not invertible, or A is singular, if and only if the rows of the matrix A are linearly dependent. And we can also um, 
it's also important to know that I'm, I'm using rows here of a matrix are linearly dependent. If the rows are linearly dependent, that means also that the columns are linearly dependent. So um, it can be the rows or the columns, they're both, again, equivalent. So related to this, or the, con the um, sort of the opposite of this, is that if the rows of a matrix A are linearly independent, then A has an inverse, or A is non-singular. And the same the other way around. If A has an inverse, or A is non-singular, then we know that its rows or columns are linearly independent. A is, invertible, a is not invertible if and only if the determinant is equal to zero. So here, if A is not invertible, then we know that the determinant is equal to zero. Or if the determinant is equal to zero, we know that A is not invertible. And related to that, if A has an inverse, so it is invertible, then we know that the determinant is not equal to zero. Or if the determinant is not equal to zero, we know that A has an inverse. And so all of these are just different ways of saying the same thing. All of these conditions are equivalent. So this allows us to talk about um, the condition of a matrix. So this is the last section in this um, in this section here. So characteristics of a singular system or matrix are that the system has either no unique solution or an infinite solutions. So we saw this previously. Basically, a singular system, the determinant is equal to zero, um, A does not have an inverse, all those things are equivalent, and it means that the equations that make up the system are linearly dependent. And so we saw um, in the previous video that that means that we'll end up with either no unique solution or an infinite number of solutions. Or it's, or there are no unique, so which means that there is no unique solution. Um, and again, this equivalently means that at least two rows or equations are linearly dependent or incompatible. And it means that the determinant of A is equal to zero. And it means that the inverse of A cannot be found. So again, all of these are just different ways of saying the same thing, that the system is singular. So in, arith in exact arithmetic, matrices are either singular or they're not singular. Um, so singular or non-singular. But in numerical analysis, or finite precision arithmetic, this boundary is not so sharp. So we can have a matrix that is almost singular, and um, in that case we say that it's ill-conditioned. So for example, consider these two cases um, of linear uh, systems of equations. So case one, I've got x1 plus x2 equals 2, and x1 plus 1.0001x2 is equal to 2.0001. Now, if I just make one small change um, to this fourth decimal place in my second system, I have now x1 plus x2 equals 2, and x1 plus 1.0001x2 is equal to 2.0002. And we can see um, what effect this has on the result. So a very small change in um, our system. Let's see what effect it has on, on the result for our solution x. So in the first case, um, we, f we can solve this and see that x1 equals 1 and x2 equals 1. And this satisfies our equation. Um, in the second case, we solve this and we get that x1 equals 0 and x2 equals 2. And this satisfies the equations in our second case. So you can see um, the system is ill-conditioned because as you can see, small changes in the elements of the coefficients or the constants, so either the elements of a or b, caused a large difference in the solution. So I just changed one um, value at the fourth decimal place in um, my b, and that made this big difference in the solution. So either 1, 1, or 0, 2 is quite a big difference in the solution. So, um, and these small perturbations are, are not unreasonable. They may be the result of data inaccuracy. So if you're using getting data from experiments, or they could be from accumulated round-off errors in a numerical procedure. So it's not unreasonable to have these small perturbations, and if something small like that can cause a large um, change in your solution, then the system is ill-conditioned, and it's important to be aware of, of that and its consequences. So we can measure the condition of a matrix um, using something called the condition number. 
So a system of equations ax equals b is said to be ill-conditioned when just the matrix A is ill-conditioned. Um, and so we can quantify this degree of conditioning of a system using the condition number. So the condition number of a matrix can be computed as the product of the norm of the matrix and the norm of its inverse. So this condition, condition number of A, you find, you have the matrix A, you find its norm, you find its inverse, and then you find the norm of the inverse, and then you multiply those two together and you get the condition number of A. So what is the norm of a matrix? Well, we talked about the norm of a vector previously, um, and we said uh, that for a vector, um, or for a vector space in general, there are multiple definitions of the norm, and we talked about the Euclidean norm for a vector. Um, so in this case, any norm can be used to give us an idea of the condition of a matrix. And um, so we can extend the idea of the Euclidean norm to matrices, um, and the extension is, is shown here. So this, again, is our, our definition of our, the condition number. So if we have a matrix A and we multiply it by its inverse, um, A inverse, then we should get the identity matrix. And so if, and the, the norm of the identity matrix would be equal to one. So um, if we consider that the condition of the, condition number of the identity matrix would be one, then this means a well-conditioned system would have a small condition number close to one, and a badly conditioned system would have a large condition number. So ill conditioning can occur when the determinant of A is close to zero, suggesting that A is nearly singular.